All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to get into Deuteronomy chapter 11. Let's go over a little bit. Chapters 1 through 4 are about failure. Chapters 5 through 11 are about mutual love. Chapters 12 through 20 are obligations of a God-related people. Chapters 27 through 30 are alternatives for a God-related people. And chapters 31 through 33 are arrangements for continuity. So love for man was initiated by God. It didn't come as a response to human activity. God's love for Israel began with his choice of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were expected to respond with wholehearted love and devotion, tapping all the resources of of their being, the heart and soul, strength and mind exclusively. No other gods allowed or tolerated in the relationship. So let's look at the treaty structure real quick. It's a national constitution, a treaty between a ruler and his subjects. You have the historical prologue reviewing the relationship which the ruler has with his subjects. You have the basic stipulations specifying the general principles that are to guide behavior. You have detailed stipulations which expands on certain rules that are to be followed. You have a document clause calling for ratification by the subjects themselves. You have the blessings, explaining the benefits the ruler provides for good subjects. The cursings, explaining the punishments due subjects who violate treaty stipulations. And then you have the recapitulation, which summarizes the treaty. All right, let's just jump on in. We'll take the first seven verses. We'll take verses 1 through 7, remembering the ways God has already blessed. Therefore you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. Know today that I do not speak with your children who have not known and who have not seen the chastening of the Lord your God, his greatness and his mighty hand and his outstretched arm, his signs and his acts which he did in the midst of Egypt, to Pharaoh king of Egypt, and to all his land, what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and and their chariots, and how he made the waters of the Red Sea overflow them as they pursued you, and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day, what he did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place, and what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, and how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, their households, their tents, and all the substance that was in their possession, in the midst of all Israel. But your eyes have seen every great act of the Lord, which he did. So God commanded Israel to love him. Love is not a matter uh, left entirely up to our impulse or our feelings. We choose to love the Lord or not. Additionally, this reminds us of what the Lord really wants from us, our love. We could give him a hundred other things, but none of it really matters unless we give him our love. As Jesus said to the Ephesian church in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. If we lose love, we lose it all. Love for God, it never goes against his word. Some people think that their so-called love for Jesus allows them to disregard his commands. But this isn't real love at all. As Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Real love for Jesus always translates into obedience. Moses addressed the generation which saw the works of God among Israel, both blessing and chastening. He spoke to the generation that should know and remember. And there are two key associates, perhaps the instigators in the rebellion of Korah in Numbers chapter 16, Dathan and Abiram, where God vindicated his servant Moses and leader over Israel when Korah, Dathan, and Abiram challenged Moses' leadership. So Moses called Israel to remember what God did in their history. And most of history, both official and personal, is simply concerned with what man has done, but God wants us to look at history and see what he did. We learn far more and are far more benefited by looking at what God has done rather than looking at what man has done. So once again, Moses laid special stress on the inseparability of love and obedience. And that's found in chapter 6, verses 5 through 6, chapter 7, verse 9, chapters 10, verses 12 through 13, chapter 11, verse 13, chapter 19, verse 9, chapter 30, verse 6, verse 8, verse 16, and verse 20. The ultimate test of an Israelite's love for God was whether he obeyed him in John chapter 14, verse 15. In Hebrew, the command to love the Lord means to choose him for one's most intimate relationship and then to express that choice in obedience to his revealed will. All of Israel's history had been guided by the Lord for the purpose of motivating them to love him unreservedly. The discipline of the Lord refers to God's moral education of his people. Because of the waywardness of the human heart, diligent and drastic measures were needed to quell that waywardness. 
So God sent Israel to school in Egypt so that she might learn of his majesty and power, right? The mighty hand and outstretched arm found in chapter 4, verse 34, chapter 5, verse 15, chapter 7, verse 19. And respond with grateful obedience for her deliverance from Pharaoh. Israel was given distinct signs in, uh, you have the 10 plagues in chapter 11, verse 3 in Exodus, so that she might understand her experience. The incident at the Red Sea, right? The Sea of Papyrus reads, and the consequent lasting ruin brought on by the Egyptians. In Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 4, could be explained by God's miraculous deliverance and judgment. After the Egyptian experience, the Lord then sent his children to school in the desert for 40 years. Here, their moral education was further refined as they had to depend on him totally for all their needs. The vague reference, what he did for you in verse 5, recalled God's miracles for his people in the wilderness, including the water from the rock in Exodus chapter 17 verses 1 through 7, the manna and the quail in Exodus 16. God's discipline, however, was not always positive. In the Exodus experience, the people learned about God's grace and power, and in the desert, they learned of his providential care. Then in the rebellion of Dathan and Abiram in number 16, Israel learned about God's holiness. Had it not been for Moses' intercession, the Lord would have put an end to the entire nation in Numbers 16 verse 45 for their grumbling unbelief in Numbers 16 verse 41. Moses exhorted the people to learn from their past for God had constructed their history with a didactic purpose. The stress on your own eyes and the double mention of the children not seeing the events of this period in Deuteronomy chapter 11 verses 2 and 5. Hint at the parents' responsibility to set an example of obedient living for their children and to pass on the truths learned from these experiences. Experiences. So Moses wanted the people to draw an important conclusion from his brief review of their history in verses 1 through 7. Since God had designed Israel's past experiences to bring about a moral education, it should have been plain to the nation that their experience in the Lord's grace or judgment depended on their moral behavior. Therefore, they could prosper in the new land only by observing or obeying all of God's commands. The strength of the Israelites was directly related to their obedience. So the supernatural ability to conquer enemies stronger than they and the ability to live long in the land was ultimately a question of ethics, not military skill. And you could look at chapter 4, verse 40, chapter 5, verse 16, chapter 6, verse 2, chapter 25, verse 15, and chapter 32, verse 47 for that. All right. Verses 8 through 15 will talk about blessings in the new land. Therefore, you shall keep my commandment, which I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give your fathers to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden, but in the land which you cross, over to fulfill it is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it, from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain that you may gather in your grain your new wine and your oil, and I will send grass in your fields for your livestock, that you may eat and be filled. So remembering what God did in history should lead Israel to a greater obedience and enable them to take the promised land. The sacrifices in obedience were well worth it for Israel. They had to they had the promise of a land which was far superior to Egypt, which did not need to be artificially irrigated, but was watered by rains which God would send upon the obedient nation. In calling Egypt a place where they watered by foot, it refers to the system of artificial irrigation, using foot-driven pumps to lift the water from the Nile to nearby fields. Canaan was so rich it did not need this type of irrigation. So God simply promised to provide for Israel if they chose to obey him and put him first. As Jesus said, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. The promise of the blessing of rain was important because one of the attractive uh, of the Canaanite gods was Baal, the god who was said to control the weather and the rain. Perhaps the Israelites would be tempted to think, well, we are in Canaan, and if we want rain, we should worship the Canaanite god of rain. 
But the Lord makes it clear that if they would worship and obey him, then he would supply the abundant rain. The early rain fell in October and November, and it was important to help soften the ground for plowing and preparing the soil for the seed. The latter rain fell about April and helped the crops come to final harvest. And God declared his special care for the land of Israel both then and now. All right. So Moses wanted the people to draw an important conclusion from his brief review of their history in verse 1 through 7. Since God had designed Israel's past experiences to bring about her moral education, it should have been plain to the nation that their experiencing the Lord's grace or judgment depended on their moral behavior. Therefore, they could prosper in the new land only by observing or obeying all of God's commands. The strength of the Israelites was directly related to their obedience. So the supernatural ability to conquer enemies stronger than they and the ability to live long in the land was ultimately a question of ethics, not military skill. And you can look at chapter 4, verse 40, chapter 5, verse 16, chapter 6, verse 2, chapter 25, verse 15, chapter 32, verse 47. So mentioning the contrast between the promised land and Egypt might have been prompted by the reference to Dathan and Abiram in verse 6. These men had referred to Egypt as a land flowing with milk and honey and complained that Moses had not given them anything better back in Numbers chapter 16, verses 12 through 14. However, the land of Canaan had far more potential for agriculture, whereas the people in Egypt had to depend upon uh, manual irrigation. God's people would have rain from heaven, for he watches over the land year round. But this rain, unlike irrigation, did not depend on human ingenuity or skill, but rather on the will of Israel to obey the commands of the rain's giver. And this involves loving and serving him in Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 12. The autumn rains, also called the earthy or the early rains, they came in September, October. And the spring rains are in March, April. You can look at Joel chapter 2 verse 23. Those rains begin and end the rainy season. The rains are necessary to help crops and trees grow, including grain like wheat, flax, and barley, grape vines for wine, olive trees for oil, and grass in the fields. All right, verses 16 through 17, the danger of blessing, turning from God in times of prosperity. Take heed of yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain, and and the land yield no produce and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. So God had to warn Israel about the deceptions of prosperity. The person who turns from God in prosperity is simply deceived. They believe they are somehow responsible for the blessings received and become proud and self-reliant. Just such a judgment came upon Israel in the days of Ahab, the wicked king over Israel in the time Elijah was a prophet in 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 1. The constant need for rain kept Israel in constant dependence on the Lord. It is good for us to have things that keep us in the constant dependence on the Lord. We should never despise those things and long for the day when we will no longer need to depend on God so much. Through Moses, God again warned Israel against worshiping other gods. This was appropriately related to verses 13 through 15 because many of the gods worshipped in Canaan were fertility deities, that is, gods of grain, oil, and rain. Unless the people of Israel were extremely careful, they could easily be enticed by their pagan neighbors to enter the sensual worship of these deities. It would simply be a matter of transferring their trust in the Lord for the fertility of their land to one of the more false gods. And this worship, which was was divorced from the realm of ethics, which emphasized ritual sex, was so appealing to human hearts that careless and morally undisciplined Israelites will be drawn into its fatal web. The wrath of God expressed in famine, he will shut the heavens, could be avoided by abstaining from worshiping false gods. This was ironic for Israel's attempt to guarantee rain by worshiping Canaanite gods would result in God's withholding rain. All right, verses 18 through 21, you're going to have blessing is gained by keeping the word of God always before you. Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lay down, when you rise up, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house 
and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them like the days of the heavens above the earth. God called Israel to not only read the word of God and to know the word of God, but to treasure it. In the same way, we should love God's word and miss it when we are separated from the word of God. We should call it to mind with longing, having laid it up in our heart and soul. God's word was to be the topic of their conversation. We can fairly measure our love for God's word by how much we will talk about it with others. God doesn't want us to have a secret love relationship with his word. However, right, the will to avoid this sin, right, Israel's will to avoid this sin was so weak that it could only be sustained by diligent attention to the words of Moses concerning divine grace and deliverance as well as sin and judgment. They were to fix those words in their hearts in chapter 6 verse and minds on attaching those words to their hands and foreheads. You see comments on uh, back in chapter 6, verse 8 in an earlier episode. Only by letting God's words invade every area of their lives and homes and by diligently teaching them to their children, right, chapter 6, verse 7, could the nation hope to escape the seduction of false worship and find permanent prosperity in the land of promise given by the Lord on oath to their forefathers, right? The same principle applies to Christians today. Commitment to know and obey the scriptures keeps believers from contemporary forms of false worship. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 9 with 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 14 through 17. Therefore, Paul exhorted all Christians to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. So at this point in the speech, Moses turned from the theme of longevity in the land to the successful conquest of the land. The people were to love the Lord in chapter 6 verse 5. Obedience to the specific commands was essentially an expression of one's love for God, right? Chapter 11, verse 1. And consistent allegiance to Him, right? Hold fast to Him. Chapters 10, verse 20, chapter 13, verse 4, and chapter 30, verse 20. To have consistent have consistent allegiance to Him was an evidence of love. Stepping on my words today. All right, verses 22 through 25, you're going to have the promise of blessing. For if you carefully keep all these commandments, which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, ways and to hold fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you, and you will dispossess greater and mightier nations than yourselves. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours." From the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will put the dread of you and the fear of you upon all the land where you tread, just as he said to you. So all the commandments are summarized in three phases or phrases. Each of these speaks of more than a bare, compelled obedience. They speak of a real relationship of love between God and his people, with obedience flowing naturally from that relationship. God promised to fight the battles for an obedient Israel. Many desire God to fight their battles, but have little interest in obeying him, or cultivating the deep relationship of love, which obedience grows from. So God repeated this promise to Joshua, right? Every place on which the sole of your foot treads. Just when Israel was about to cross over the Jordan River into Canaan in Joshua chapter 1 verse 3. And no man will be able to stand against you. When Israel walked in love with the Lord and was obedient to him, they were unbeatable. No man could defeat them. Greater was God who was with them than he who was in the world. First John chapter 4 verse 4. So in return for their obedience, the Lord would grant Israel supernatural success against superior, larger, and stronger enemy armies. Verse 26 or 20, 28, you have the choice, a blessing or a cursing. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. All right. Straightforward. The three great elements of the Old Covenant were the law, the sacrifice, and the choice. Israel had a choice to obey and be blessed or disobey and be cursed. It was a cause and effect relationship with God. And it is important to recognize that we, in Jesus Christ, do not have an Old Covenant relationship with God. We expect to be blessed not because of our obedience, but because of our position in Jesus Christ. The curse was deserved, the curse we deserved was laid upon him in Galatians chapter 3 verses 10 through 14, right? Which states, For as 
many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Right, So though there may be an inherent curse of consequences in our disobedience or even in the correcting hand of God under the new covenant, he does not punish us or curse us because all that we deserved past, present, and future was poured out upon Jesus Christ. It's important to understand that. And it was up to Israel if they wanted to be blessed, then they could walk in obedience, right? As they were in the days of David and Solomon. But if they disobeyed, they would be cursed, as they were in most of the days of the later kings. The choice was required. There was no neutral ground. God wouldn't just leave them alone. It would either be a blessing or a cursing. One or the other. Mind you, this is prior to the cross. Inherent in Israel's disobedience was idolatry. Whenever we walk in disobedience, we exalt ourselves against God and declaring that our rules, standards, our desires are all more important than His. This is idolatry in its most base and common form. So He would not put a terror and fear in their enemies so that they could not fight successfully against Israel. Rahab's words to the spies, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us in Joshua chapter 2 verse 9 are one example of the fulfillment of this promise. And you can also look at Exodus chapter 15, verse 15 and 16, Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 25, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 10, Joshua chapter 2, verses 11 and 24, and Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. Had Israel continued to obey God faithfully, her boundaries would have been enlarged. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 24. To fulfill the promise made to Abraham in Genesis 15, verse 18, but because of Israel's disobedience, the fulfillment of the whole land promise is still yet future. <clears throat> so, verses 26 through 32 of chapter 11 form a fitting conclusion to the section of Moses' speech. Once again, he emphasized that the history of Israel will be determined by her ethnicity ethical relationship to the Lord. And let's cover verses 29 through 32, making the choice known unto the people. Now it shall be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess, that you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Elbal or Ebel. Are they not on the other side of the Jordan, toward the setting sun, in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the plain opposite Gilgal, beside the terebinth trees of Morah? For you will cross over the Jordan and go in to possess the land which the Lord your God has given you, and you will possess it and dwell in it. And you shall be careful to observe all the statutes and judgments which I, which I set before you today. So, the reciting of the blessings on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal will be detailed in later chapters, yet it is plain that God wanted the word to get to the entire nation, because the entire nation was part of his covenant, you know, this covenant with him specifically. The name Gerizim is supposed to be associated with fruitful harvests, and the name Abal is supposed to be associated with barrenness. And that'll tie up Deuteronomy chapter 11. Next time we'll get into chapter 12, covering the worship God commands. Thank you for joining me.